Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Man, it's been a busy day. <sighs> Seems like when you want to rest, that's when everybody wants your attention. But good things are happening. Good things are getting done, even though uh, I'm kind of tired. <clears throat> Laws are making progress. That's a good thing. I'm able to help people too. That's nice. There's a story behind all that, but we'll get into that some other time. All right, so tonight we're going to be reading out of Numbers eleven twenty three. Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. The whole verse says, And the Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. Let's go up here and let's see some context on this. Let's see. Let's start in verse 17. And then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat for you shall have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. The Lord's going to satisfy their, their needs and even their desires in this case. You shall eat, not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come up out of Egypt? The people were speaking against God. They were seeing the miracles. They were witnessing it. They knew what was going to be happening. It wasn't like any of it was kept from them. They understood the whole scenario, and yet they were getting mad with the Lord. There's some conviction here. They were upset with the Lord. They were questioning the Lord. How many people are doing that concerning the rapture today? A lot. A lot, unfortunately. We know what's going to happen. The Lord's revealed everything to us. It's not like anything's been kept from us. And yet that happens today, too, just like it did back then, unfortunately. He'll get us through it, though. <laughs> Hopefully it's not coming out our nostrils. That would, in, in, that would indicate vomiting. And Moses said, The people who I am among are 600,000 men on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat, that they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? Because it's a lot of people. So Moses, in a way, was doubting here. And the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Moses, do you doubt me now? Now you shall see whether I will say, whether what I say will happen to you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered the 70 men and the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. This is interesting. When the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. That was, it was one shot deal. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Radad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp. He and the elders of Israel. And then the quail. He was going to say he was going to feed them. Remember, I told you about this. Whenever Ron Wyatt found that spot where that had happened, and he was pretty sure that was where it was, because they were using the Bible as a map, but they were tracing the path, and they found a lot of evidence. He said about, about I forget what time of day it was. I think it was later in the day. This huge flock of quail came in and landed and all around them on the ground. All these thousands of years, those quail are still going there to that same spot. It's evidence of God and his providence 
to this very day, nobody's there, but to this very day, that the flock of quail goes to that same spot. Thousands of them. Amazing. God keeps his promises even when no one's there to receive them. God had made a positive promise to Moses that for the space of a whole month, he would feed the vast host in the wilderness with flesh. Moses, being overtaken by a fit of unbelief, looks to the outward means and is at a loss to know how the promise can be fulfilled. They struggled. We, the same thing happens to us today. We struggle. Lord, how are you going to do this thing? He looked to the creature instead of the creator. But doth the creator expect the creature to fulfill his promise for him? No. He who makes the promise ever fulfills it by his own unaided omnipotence. If he speaks, it is done, done by himself. His promises do not depend for their fulfillment upon the cooperation of the puny strength of man. We don't help God do these things. He may use us, but we don't help him. We can at once perceive the mistake which Moses made. And yet, how commonly do we do the same? God has promised to supply our needs, and we look to the creature to do what God has promised to do. And then, because we perceive the creature to be weak and feeble, we indulge in unbelief. We do this. We do this as people. We struggle with this. Constantly look into the world. Oh, how am I going to do this? Oh, how am I going to do that? It's part of faith and trust. Why look we to that quarter at all? Will you look to the North Pole to gather fruits ripened in the sun? Verily, you would act no more foolishly if you did this than when you look to the weak for strength and to the creature to do the Creator's work. Let us then put the question on the right footing. The ground of faith is not the sufficiency of the visible means for the performance of the promise, but the all-sufficiency of the invisible God who will most surely do as he hath said. If after clearly seeing that the oneness lies with the Lord and not with the creature, we dare to indulge in mistrust, the question of God comes home mightily to us, the conviction. <laughs> Has the Lord's hand waxed short? May it happen too in his mercy that with the question there may flash upon our souls that blessed declaration, thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Even when we doubt whether God is or will or can do something, and it happens, even in the strongest of believers, even if we doubt, the Lord is going to do it anyway because he's going to prove himself. You doubt? Cool. Well, that's not going to stop me from doing anything, and God shows himself anyway. People doubted the Red Sea crossing. Found it. People doubted the city of um, Jericho. Found it. People doubted uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Found it. In fact, they found all the cities, including a couple of others that were loosely re referred to in the Bible that also were destroyed uh, later on after Lot left them. I believe Zoar was one of them. We doubted Mount Sinai. Found it. And it is beyond doubt that that's Mount Sinai. Beyond doubt. The one in Saudi Arabia, not the other one. The other one didn't match the Bible description at all. Everything that has been told, cities that they thought did not exist, places they thought that were, were invented, we found them all. And we continue to find more every day, more and more evidence every day, every week. Something new is being shown to people. Look what we found. Oh, there's no proof Moses wrote those five books. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, just two years ago, roughly, they find a corner of a scroll in the dump in the Valley of Hebron. Because they're doing a lot of excavation down there. You know, that's been a dump for thousands of years. They take that scroll and they open it and they check it and they look at it. They do a special process. To, it's got writing on it. It's Hebrew. They translate it. It's Exodus 12, and it's a perfect match to what we have today. Then they dated it, and they said, this was written when Moses was alive. 
No proof? Found it. <laughs> I mean, you just, you, every single time you try to disprove the Bible, we find evidence that it's real. We find evidence that it's true. People now have to come to the conclusion that they just don't want it to be true. It's not that it isn't. They just don't want it to be. And God is doing that. And he's doing that with everything. He's doing that with everyone. He's showing everybody their true what the true agenda is, and he's showing where their true intentions lie. So, you know, you can see who an actual person is or an actual person isn't. You can see if somebody really is there because of God or there because of their own selfish ambitions. You can really see if somebody really is a born-again believer or not. And every day it gets more and more obvious. Every day they reveal themselves. Every day they show what they're really about, who they're really there for, and why. Every day we get to see what our true intentions are. The Lord is revealing all this on purpose, and because we're close to the end, everything is going to be made known. All things will be made known. Everything done in the dark will be manifested in the light. Everything done in secret will be made known to everyone. If we know what the future holds, because God told us, if we know a pattern from the past will be the same pattern in the future. If we know we have this more sure word that tells us these things, why do we still struggle whether God can do it or not? Oh, look at my situation. Look at what's going on in my Look at how all this, and I can't take it. I can't, I, I can't handle it. There's no way that God can save me from this. Why do you cut him to the quick? It may be that because of those situations, he is literally in the process of saving you. It's just because our perspective is so limited. We fail to see it. I think we can dedicate more time and, and more of ourselves to sitting back and going, you know what, Lord, you said this. I believe what you said. I'm going to consider that one of your promises. You said it. I believe it. I'm going to hold you to it. And you know what God says in return? And there's a verse on this. Test me. See what I'll do. Reason this out. Reason this out with God. This is what he said. He'll do it. I believe he'll do it. Now, here's an amazing thing about that. It may be something he doesn't do in our lifetime. It may be something that happens to our siblings or to our children or to uh, another generation after them. But he'll do it. The prophets that spoke of all the future things, the Bible says they sought to see these things. They wanted to know more about this. They looked into it more. Even angels were doing that. They wanted to know more about this because it was this was remarkable to them. And it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? It wasn't, it wasn't for them. It was for a future generation, as the Bible states. Daniel has told this a couple times. This is for a future generation, uh, Daniel. Don't worry about it. Seal it up. It's not for you. It's not for your, your generation. It's for another one. Just because he made those promises and they didn't get to see it doesn't mean he's not going to fulfill it. He's fulfilling it right now. <laughs> We're the recipients of those promises. That's amazing. So just because we don't see it happen according to what when we think it should happen or even how it should manifest according to our perspective doesn't mean he's not doing it. He's doing it his way and his way is the best way. And it takes a, a bit of effort to bring yourself to that place where you convince yourself, you know what, I, I'm going to trust him on this. Even though I may not see it happen, even though I may not see it, man, I may not see the people I'm praying for get saved, but it may be that after I'm gone, they do. Just because they don't now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. A lot of people are like that. They pray and think it should happen within 10 minutes or within a day. I've been praying for them for years and the Lord hasn't said them yet. That, so? He said he would save them. If that was what it says in the Bible, we can bank on that. It may not happen in our vision. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it'll happen. Because he said he would. The Lord wishes no one. He wishes all to be saved, that no one is condemned. And so it, it's in his best, best interest and in for his glory that everybody gets saved. And so if we pray for them, I'm fully confident he will. I don't know how he'll do it, but you know what? I don't need to know. There's things that I, there's certain things I don't need to know. There's a lot of things that I don't need to be aware of.
I trust him. I trust him to do it. Because in this world, I have nothing else and no one else I can trust him. Friends will let you down. Family will let you down. Acquaintances will let you down. Neighbors will let you down. Governments will let you down. Leaders will let you down. God will never let you down. So if he said it, I believe it. I believe he'll do it. It may not happen in my my vision. It may not happen while I'm still here, but I know he'll do it because he said he would. And if he said he would, it's going to happen. But what I love is that he's showing us he's going to do it. Oh, you guys want to doubt me? Okay, I understand. It's kind of rough right now. Getting near the end. I get it. It's hard. You have a little strength. I'm going to show you. Watch, watch my miracle. You'll see with your own eyes. So since that's, what, that's what's happening right now, are we willing to accept that as proof? A great many people are not. God is literally proving his written word true with archaeological evidence, with the planets, with everything that's happening in today. Named nations and their activities at the end all happening. He's proving his word true. People aren't accepting it. Let us not, as individuals, be those kind of people. But let us accept the word of God. Accept that what he's doing is true. Accept that he is going to keep every promise he made. Because for those of us that believe, we shall see the greater glory in his name, in his glory, and in his presence. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.